Hello there everyone and thank you for joining me here at the start of a new campaign in Tierno, the last of Europe in which we're playing as maybe some people's favorite continent in South America, Brazil, in which I've actually played as Brazil before but it's been quite a while and I was actually back when this used to be an independent mod from Tierno but this is all now in base Tierno so we have the Lot Presidency and the last time, or really the first time I played this, I did play as Lot, I did go down Quadros' plan, but we still went with Lot so... We're doing fireworks right now, and we're probably going to go down this route, at least the Navis plan, just because it makes it a little different than the last time I played this. A year has passed, and a lot has gotten a lot of work done, opening in Brasilia, managing the economy, beginning the construction of the Trans-Amazonian Highway, and dealing with the coffee strikes. After all this work, a lot is exhausted and needs a break. The New Year's celebrations present, or present the perfect opportunity for this. While there's a throng in the streets celebrating another year passed without nuclear annihilation and sharing their hope that the Hawaiian Missile Crisis will continue to escalate, a lot will spend it in his study, taking a well deserved rest. Let Quadros and Neves take care of the government for just this week, then it'll be back to work with old general. Coffee with Neves. Enrique Taquerza Lot will now meet with Tancredo Neves in order to discuss the economic situation that our Republic now finds itself in. Senor Lot believes that Neves' help will be the weapon he needs in order to put Brazil's economic base or economic chaos to them. As for Senor Neves, he wishes to discuss managing the economy and development of Brazil and believes that the president is the best place to see Brazil's economic revival through. Needless to say, the cups and the fine Brazilian coffee that Lot and Neves gulped down during this meeting may as well turn out to be the most important drinks in modern Brazilian history, but I forgot about this. We have this here on the development panel. Um, I'm not sure which one we want. More mechanization or more industry? Because we have encouraged migration. We'll encourage, uh, provide economic initiatives for rural residents of the southeast region, or wherever region, uh, to move to the cities, providing an apple labor force for the region's industrial sector. The so monthly urban population growth, not bad or a sponsor industrial growth. Through subsidies and tax breaks, we'll encourage industry to develop in the southeast region, which will get more monthly industrial growth, and GDP will receive a small boost. We can subsidize mechanization. Farmers in the region can keep our nation well fed, but they toil without access to the latest technology. To show our gratitude, we'll ensure the newest tractors, trucks, and combines are imported at affordable prices. Monthly mechanization growth, rate growth, one of the affected states' of GDP growth will increase, which sounds like the one we want to do, and there's requisition assets. With all the aid we provide in the past, it's not only right that the industrial base in the region should be put to use for purposes. While it may discourage industrial growth for the future, it'll still be a boon to reserves in the short term. Um, I don't want to hurt our growth, so this one says growth, and I want more growth. So, as you can see, the mechanization rate, the urban population, and industry uh, percent of GDP, and it's not very good to hear too. Um, honestly, lightly developed, partially industrialized, so it sounds kind of cool. Um, I want to play to our strengths. Urban population... Uh, Maybe over here, mechanization rate? Let's do this one. Cost 10, uh, political power to do so. But it cre increases GDP, so. So GDP. Also, we have the electro uh, electronics, active projects. Trans Amazonian Highway. It's a uh, most ambitious and an infrastructure project in Brazil's history. Aim to provide access to resources in the Amazon interior and to create a land route to Peru and Colombia. It's less than 20% done, though. Currently allocating four production units to the highway, costing $0.04 billion a year and $0.05 daily political power, allowing development to progress by. 11.5% every year. That's not enough. 0.08 billion. It's going to cost us a lot, but little wooden boats. We're getting nowhere, Henrique. Odilio Dennis was a broad man, the type of man who was quick to anger and fast to laughter. He could always be trusted to speak his mind and to, to tell a colleague exactly where they fell down and where they excel, though they were in many ways opposites. The president Lot held Dennis as one of his closest friends for years. Unfortunately, Lot didn't have the capacity for war minister's bluntness at the moment. Both men were hunched over a large war table, depicting the waters affected by Brazil's latest national emergency. Wooden figurines of the proud Brazilian Navy lay scattered on the surface in the latest rough battle plan Law had devised, an attempt to halt the thousands of pirates infesting Brazilian seas and stealing Brazilian capital already. The pirates have taken millions of dollars worth of fish and lobster from Brazil's waters, putting hundreds of fishermen out of business. Law had been repositioning the figures with Denny's input for hours, but to no avail. The president sighed. Resources are limited, Odilio. We have to find a way to end these pirates with our current task force, unless you have ships we can reassign in your back pocket. Denny's folded his arms, now stared intently at the largest cluster of ships. Uh, defense is getting us nowhere. Our destroyers are a waste of trying to get out, uh, to screen out every ramshackle pirate that steals from us. We need to get where they take their product. The German vessels and pirate convoys attack, not defend. They need to preach his aggressive tactics throughout their planning, but Law was unconvinced. A more diplomatic approach, if he could make it work, might solve the problem without sending every Brazilian sailor thousands of miles from home. The elements of the Free France still hold a decent amount of ships. Surely the Germans were completely unreasonable. One thing was certain, though. The lobster war was to be solved immediately, before any more lives were lost. Fine, let's go. Someone was knocking at the door quite insistently too. Dennis walked from the table and flung it open, revealing a nervous looking secretary. What? The president asked not to be disturbed. The secretary nervously smiled at him, peeking around the bulky door and stared at the president. Sir? Quadros has been, has been calling you for half an hour. And we have the power struggle here between Quadros and Lot. Um, well, we have distractions too. 
After joining our forces, we want high loyalty. We want low nepotism. Because nepotism is not very good. We have the hardliners. Uh, we have the Sorbonne. And we have the Constitutionals, which we want to empower as much as we can. But, you know, whatever. Yes, Quadros. Oh, what is so incredibly urgent? A lot laid back in his chair, eyes closed. Yanlio Quadros was hardly his idea of an ideal vice president, but like it or not, Quadros was who the people wanted. Could be effective, or on occasion, certainly, but Quadros could also be abrasive. Lord, I've been in... <clears throat> Wait for two hours! Listen, listen, are you listening to the Argentinians? They're building this dam, right? And it'll be bad for us, for Brazil. Terrible! So I need your signature or something to get them to stop, I think. You look, you took a very long time, sir. But, Yanlio, are you drunk? Lotto was irritated. It sent Quadros to Argentina to negotiate with them over the dam not to get drunk. You took too long, so you had a little drink, tiny, these little Argentinians. Bah, they aren't going to see me until tomorrow anyways, why not? Four hours ago, when I started calling, I was sober, you just took too long. This is entirely inappropriate, Yanyo. I don't even understand what you want from me, but let's have this conversation tomorrow. B.S. I've been calling for eight hours a lot, just to say the thing. Oh, that's, I, I, that I can do. That. that I can pay back construction costs? I think that's it. Say, say, come on. They make me uh, pay to call, make calls from Henry K. Fine, fine, do what you need, Yanyo, but tomorrow I need a full report on whether it is you're trying to tell me, understood? Yes, I'll do those things. Good night, Enrique. Thanks. Be quicker next time. Quadro said before hanging up. Sleep it off, Yanyo. Go in my place. Cafe. Observation Lobster. For the past few years, we've had a deal with our... Well, the press has dubbed the Lobster Wars. Our territorial waters are subject to continuous incursions by African pirates, foreign ship, merchant boats, and German warships. Our local fishermen harassed and the livelihood suffer while wealthy vultures in the so-called capital of the world feast on our lobster just recently. A Japanese couple was taken hostage by pirates, resulting in a major diplomatic crisis. Walter has declared that he will end this war. No more will German naval craft violate our waters. No more will African fisher steal our lobster. The Zen lot. Has arranged a meeting with Admiral Arnaldo Toscano, the promise in the ships and resources he needs. An attorney asked for one guarantee from the Admiral that he will make Brazil victorious in the conflict. Large amounts of illegal fishing has occurred within our waters without being stopped. Law will order Admiral Toscano to end this once and for all. But natural spirits and nepotism the army's low, which is good. We have overbearing military. Eh, it's not great. I'd rather not have this one. Unchecked corruption. Very bad. Rapid industrialization is okay, not bad. We have lobster wars, not good. And we have the Trans Amazonian Highway, which is costing us a lot, but you know what? We need to do it. We have national liberalism. The lights of Rio. <laughs> Francisco, one of the millions crowding Rio's Copacabana Beach to celebrate the advent of a new year. Cheers the first of the fireworks began to light up the skies. She kept her three children closer tied to her against the flow and crush of the crowd. Hundreds of thousands of Brazilians who traveled to the beach from miles around to share in the joy of a new year. Food trucks and tents set up all over the white sands were left empty as their owners joined the raucous celebrations. Fireworks are absolutely magnificent this year. Vibrant greens, blues, reds, every color imaginable lit up the skies, banishing all of Rio's darkness. For Francisca, the year had brought far too much of that darkness into her life, but now as Rio was filled with light, her own problems seemed to evaporate in the glow. Brazil was, not kind of single mothers, but Francisca, surrounded by hope, felt accepted for the first time in decades. Things would be different tomorrow. She would take her children back to the crap apartment they called home. Go back to six hours of sleep, des desperately taken in between constant work. Go back to watching rich men walk past those even worse off than her without even a glance. But as she watched the brilliant lights of the new year light up the Rio, Rio sky, Francisca thought just how things were slowly getting better. Every day things seemed just a bit cheaper, every paycheck just a bit bigger. The world just a tiny bit more equitable. Despite everything, she was proud of her country, so long as bros is still kept to its course, Francisco might just be okay. Help us in the air. Look at that poverty reduction, but we have an insane amount of inflation. Oh my god. Nearly death is not good, too. Insane inflation. Honestly, fresh off the presses might be good. Um, but so much inflation, I'm, I think, that was so much. I want more growth, but if we can reduce, reduce by 20%, that's probably, honestly, the, for the best. Uh, we're building roads. Let's do that, and we'll go that. Why not? And we want to increase uh, our growth as well, of course, too. And we have our own Brazilian sphere. Guiana Kayan. Eight million dollars. Go figure. It's making a lot of city stuff, but how much political part do we get? Oh, half of it. Oh, Jesus. We're really trying to hurt ourselves to get uh, that thing done. And, I'm, and I'll spend more money to get the the highway done. It'll take years to get done. But more growth is nice. Coffee. I love coffee, but we actually have a cup of tea here to keep us nice and warm. Victory for diplomacy. Control the helicopters touch down the uh, Recife. How do you pronounce it? Recife? And the uh, uh, sorry, former hostages are on the way back to the Japanese embassy. We did it, gentlemen. The room burst into chairs as Brazil's biggest diplomatic headache was solved. Look at that. Lots of negotiation, threats, and tracking finally paid off. The two Japanese terrorists on vacation, their daughter and son in law, one of Japan's richest men, had been kidnapped by pirates of the Brazilian coast for ransom 40 months ago. The Japanese began pressuring, even threatening the Brazilian government within days, demanding the tourists be found and returned immediately. The situation, already a massive incident, was further complicated when it revealed that the pirates were out hiding on free French waters, sheltering behind a tiny but aggressive navy that had no interest in ousting the pirates for free. In, 
Yeah, no shots were fired, but millions of dollars were spent on bribes, information, and infusement in overtime. Brazil's relationship with Japan would forever bear the black mark of this crisis, but at the moment, none of that beleaguered uh, diplomats in the crisis room could bring themselves to care. Most of them were operating on two hours of sleep, and the older members of the dip dip diplomatic corps had already begun filtering out of the room to catch a well-deserved nap. The rest were celebrating a hard-fought victory, a statement to the Brazil or to the world that Brazil could solve its own problems without, and even in spite of German and Japanese interests. In a way, as a newest member of the diplomatic corps would refer to it later, it was another victory in the long struggle against fascism. As the workers made fun of him for that one. Hey, more civility, yay! Oh, we can do stuff here? Growth rises. Screw all that. What I want is more economy growth. Wow, that was actually a big jump. Like, point eight? Yeah, that's pretty good. That ain't bad. Up to 3% total reduction. Well, it's better than nothing. 3% reduction versus 1% uh, growth. Whatever. Copy of Nevis. So summed up, we have avoided the worst crisis with our decisive action taken earlier, but inflation does still pose a problem. Lots of us look in the report that his Minister of the Economy, Tancredo Nevis, and Celso Fortaldo, his Minister of Planning, had brought to him. It was really in the morning of the sun only having risen and outside of the sky was covered with clouds. Lots of us about the coffee being given by a secretary as we waited for the two to reply. Effective, uh, effectively, that is the case Tancredo Nevis stated before speaking again. I have gathered a few economic proposals that will help us deal with this problem. Raise some taxes here and there, change interest rates, and make it harder for companies to dodge your taxes. That's just sort of the crisis. Kelso Fortado nodded and replied, and with these proposals, we can ensure economic growth continues to soar and industrialization program is not hampered. Loud nodded before smiling. Well, I'm glad that this crisis looks like it will be dealt with easily. Finally, some good. Lot they bloody shot him. Quadro shouted as he barged into the meeting room. Shahu Yanio. Lot quickly replied. He was used to Quadro's outburst by now, but someone had been shot and he could not easily dismiss the comment. Jao Pedro Texera, leader of the peasant leagues in Bariba. He was walking home with his children, then someone pulled out a gun and bloody shot him three times in the back. He was dead within the hour. The peasant leagues are furious about, the st about strikes are flying now. Flying about. Lot, Tancredo, and Celso were all looking at Quadros when he barged in and we were all quiet for a few moments. It would be Celso who spoke the silence. This complicates things when we have the fallout. Deploy the potato. Admiral Toscana has been asked for a task force and Lot has given him one. Now it just needs to be deployed. A task force will quickly be stationed in the waters off the coast of Par Pernambuco, where the fishing violations are the worst. There, Arnaldo will ensure the ensure that task force destroys any pirate ships they see and send rogue fishing craft back to Africa. This intervention will take some pressure off the administration, but the fishermen will, will be back. While Arnaldo deals with the media problem, it is up to Lot and Quadros to think of a more permanent solution to the lobster war. Election season. Sound again for Brazil's political parties to gear up for election season. In this year's elections, a third of all Senate seats are up for election, each one, one each state. The power uh, struggle between the UDN and the coalition of the PSD and the PTP hangs in the balance while the PSP looks to establish itself as electoral force. Well, the nation will get the chance to shape Brazil's future. So right now, we have PSD, which I think I did the last time, but I, I honestly can't remember it anymore, anymore. PSD. Not sitting in his chair, sitting quietly thinking about the situation, rubbing his chin as he looked at the report Quadros gave him. Quadros was pacing around the room, muttering to himself about the situation, and Tancredo Nevis and Celso. Looked awkwardly between each other, and after a brief conversation with the two eyes, Tancredo coughed. <clears throat> I believe we need to deal with the situation quickly. The cut economics and peasant leagues. We should deploy a young Jingo to talk to the peasant leagues. He's fairly popular and convince them to calm down, so trusted officers to investigate the situation to find out who did it. I agree with that excellent proposal. Most likely the first and last I will agree with Tancredo on. Quadros exclaimed out loud, Gulad may have incorrect views on economics, but those groups support him in the Brizola, willing him out may help. La uh <clears throat> Not a surprise that the room agreed <coughs> on the issue. I will be on the call to Jingo immediately. I'll get him no to go out and talk to the leagues. Hopefully, he can stop the situation from descending into chaos and under economic proposals. Tancredo believe these could be. Before Locke finished his speech, Quadros interrupted him. And Enrique, don't tell me you're going with their plan. Their plan will only boost inflation. We need to cut taxes, crack down on inflation, and deal with the growing debt if we want the economy to continue to prosper. Thank you, Janio, for your interruption, Pl uh, Lot said plainly. I will, of course, listen to all advice, and I have not yet set my action. Janio, you keep a watch on the situation. I will be calling Jingo. Tancredo and Celso. Thank you for coming, you are dismissed, Lot said. With that, the three men nodded their heads and one by one left the room. After they had left, Lot sighed and finished his coffee. Outside it began to rain. Oh, and we have this too. Senado campaign. So, Jose Gomomar. Election date. So, we are PSD. And I apologize if I've done this all before, just I don't remember very much. Does this cost? Mobilize the PSD cap uh, campaign. So it's just Senate we're doing. Campaign slander. I'd rather increase our own instead of anything else, anybody else's. So, so PSD is yellow, and we're doing okay in a lot of these regions, but hmm. is anywhere we're close-ish. 
Oh, here we go. So how long does the campaign last? Good in my place. A bespeckled man hurriedly made his way through the halls of the presidential palace, having just returned from a meeting in Argentina to discuss the damn situation. The man found some tired, yet curious as to why I was being summoned to the president's office. The meeting was a success, was it not? So why was it being called in such haste? He thought as he came up on the door of the president's office and knocked. He was greeted by an instant reply. Uh, yes, come in, Quadros opened the door and went inside. Uh, Jean, you'll please to take a rest. Quadros sat down on the face left. Yes, Enrique, why was I called in such haste? About the damn? No, no, no. This is about the upcoming visit to Tokyo, Nanking, and Washington. It's an important year. We don't often get to go to court both a sphere and the OFM with such visits, no? Yeah, I agree, but what does that have to do with me exactly? A visit to them is your duty, not mine, Quadros replied, confused as he took off his glasses and settled on the seat. Crap, well, we don't want to upset the U.S. with that. You go into the sphere in my state and ensure that the Japan invests into Brazil on the highway while I head over to Washington and reassure our American friends. Want to look as good as possible on the world stage, getting the sun's investments while not upsetting Uncle Sam? There's a lot of riding on this meeting, so I'd expect you to do your best, Blatt replied. Lighting a cigarette and sign? Edna also wants to accompany you as she wants to get into politics despite my warnings against it. I understand, though. If you don't want her to come, then I'm fine with her not joining. Quadros put his glasses back on, then suddenly tied a handkerchief around his nose and mouth, creating a bandana. His lot stared at him in confusion. Quadros replied, Sorry, it's a cigarette smoke. Lot nodded and stood up. She asked you, but that's enough talk, and I'm off to inspect the troops. Good luck, Gianio. Lot swiftly marched out of the room, leaving Quadros alone with his thoughts. Off to the land of the rising sun. So how long is the campaign? Voting blocks. Oh boy. Um, new plans, old tactics. Hello, my friend. This is your governor, Ademar de Barros. I'm glad to bring up my arrangement we've spoken about earlier with the man on the other end, a prominent business owner and politician in Sao Paulo. Hung up. Ademar stared at the receiver for a solid five seconds before signing and crumbling back in his chair. Ah, crap, he picked up his pen. Crossing a name on one long list and adding to another, one more traitor. Ever since his loss in the election, many of his more tenuous supporters had swapped sides. He'd been called jumped up bureaucrats for hours now. He'd been calling them, pulling on, putting on his usual easy air of confidence with increasing difficulty. Ademar wasn't made for calls, he wasn't made for fake niceties. Fairness appeals to idiots with frail egos. He needed to be out there shaking hands and kissing babies, leading a rally or inspiring a crowd action. Action. Worthless bureaucrats weren't going to win him his rebel seat. Action was. Ademar kept the le le from his seat. And strolled quickly out of his office, beckoning for a secretary right outside to follow him. Surprised but not unused of these kinds of outbursts, she hurriedly grabbed a stack of papers and awkwardly bought at her desk, running after him as he ducked into the hallway. Take the right most sheet off my desk and print 30, uh, 50 copies. I trust you still have a list of instigators. Uh, yeah, good, 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 good. Give them a call, tell them to ramp up recruiting and rallying, it's time to pull this back. Add them, I was already climbing into his car when he turned back around with a slight grin. I was going to stir up trouble, collect as much scrap paper as you can, as you have for when to get back, assign or revise old plans and draft some new ones. Add the Mars back, and with that, he sped off into the streets of Sao Paulo. The father-daughter talk. Oh god, that's awkward. As Enrique Lott walked down the ramp that connected the presidential office to the rest of Brazil, the president heard a voice calling for him, to his, to his delight. It wasn't one of his workers running to him to tell him about the newest worker strike, or even worse, Janio instead. Looking to his left, he saw his daughter, Edna, walking towards him, dressed in a suit and wearing a necktie, a sight her father was not used to seeing. <coughs> Edna, why are you dressed so formally? Asked Enrique. Well, father, today I'm going to meet with Brazil about my campaign. For a seat in the lower house, Edna answered confidently. Where he started to fill the patriarch of the Lot family, watching his offspring get ready to dive into a dangerous pool filled with crocodiles. Enrique swallowed the spittle inside his mouth and slightly raised his voice. Listen, Edna, I know you have excellent intentions, but as your father, I must insist you do not get involved in the world of politics, especially as a woman. The word father affirmed as Edna mentally sighed. It's nothing but a pool of crocodiles waiting for the right moment to attack and destroy you. Edna cut him off. I've already made up my mind, father. Fighting and taming those crocodiles is something I want to do. That's a duty for the country's greater good. Quickly, the worried dad realized nothing he would say would have changed your mind. Very well, then. I assume I can trust you with the task, Enrique conceded. As you know, Gianni was tasked to travel to the Co Prosperity Spirit to ensure that Japanese money kept flowing to Brazil, and I can't trust that man and not make any screw up, so I need you to inform if uh, if he attempts anything funny. And a smile and nodded, that's just what I want to talk to you about. I'll make sure everything goes smoothly. All right, then, good luck. I must not leave to inspect the troops. Love you, Edna. Enrique says he and his daughter shared a quick hug. Love you too, Dad, as the marshal walked out. He suddenly stopped on his tracks. Oh, and Edna, keep alcohol away, alcohol away from jean -Yo. He can make a big old mistake. Oh, so we're back here. So does it take a week? And But it's back. It is back. Okay. Oh. Don't you dare do this. How dare you? How dare you? Which one do you want to do next? To plug the fatilla. Little act, his good lads today have been going well enough. He woke up with a firm understanding of what would the day bring. He spoke with friends over what he would meet them next. And it was almost at work by the time that uh, that he tripped. Why it became such a bother to Gulart was what he tripped on, just next to, to a dark alleyway. It was the foot of a man lying in the mud. Before he could even stumble to the ground, Gulart's hand shot out in front of him. Crap, sorry, that's on me. Under a small newsstand's worth of newspaper, the man seemed to be laying down as though he was hiding from bloodhounds or bear as the mud beneath him squished as his hands lay back in the watery dirt. It was insulting to see even someone laying perfectly still in the mud. Gulart was taken aback more than anything before reaching out at his hand. Here, up. 
It was a sign of heat. The two men were standing next to each other, one looking considerably worse for wear than the other. The man seemed to be partially protected from the mud. Still, some swaths of it covering his back, which Gullar couldn't help but frequently try to wipe off the mud. You all right? The man stood with a look in his eye. The Gullar was pained to even see. His mind flew to the speech he was going to give to later today. Wiping out the mud on the poor man was more than enough for to let his mind fly to the Oro and those dudes on the other end of the PSD that let him lay there. Gullar could feel some of the new adjustments being given to his speech. He was already uncertain, though. Sure, just fine, thank you. Look in his eyes. That of a man betrayed a thousand times over, offered one last betrayal, and revealed how much a man had been laying there. Gulard checked his watch, five minutes. Listen, there's a kitchen down the road to the left. Get yourself cleaned up, and I'll meet you there in an hour. The man looked at Gulard with what anyone could see as appreciation, even if he didn't say a word. Gulard smiled and walked to the speech. Stop the companies. Anti piracy. So, last time I did this, I went with this this way. So, we're probably going to go see the ships. Anti-piracy operations. Oh, even though I do want to do this one, though. Inflation decreases. Interest rates will increase. Business taxes. But for a good while now, we had to deal with pirates and fishermen coming from the anarchic coast of West Africa and engaging in illegal fishing and a thousand other kinds of criminal enterprise within our maritime borders. They profit from these ventures and get away with it, but we get blamed whenever something goes wrong, of course. A uh, recent incident involving Japanese spirits is a sign of what could come. If we want to prevent further disruption to the sky, we must wipe oh, this piracy out completely. Look at that growth, 9%. Hey, that's looking not too bad. How much are you reducing it by? 0.6. Hey, that's already 10%. That's... Yeah. Well, Lobster World. Lots of reading the latest documents that covered his desk. New reports of piracy and illegal fishing just off the coast of Pernab Pernambuco has been reported to the government. The main ports of origin, the German colony of Central Africa, and the numerous West African states. Lots lot cough before saying this is a matter of national security. We have to stop this lobster war immediately. Across his desk sat Odilio Dennis, his war minister was smoking a big fat cigar, and whose face had grown angry as the meeting went on, and the numerous reports of the breach of Brazilian waters have been discussed. Right next to him was the Admiral Arnaldo Toscano, the man who was dealing with these threats to the north. Toscano looked exhausted, with dark circles under his eyes, notably Vice President Quadros was not there, a lot having decided to not invite him to this meeting. I've been trying to stop it, Arnaldo Toscano said. I've already directed for two destroyers to confront the pirates and fishermen, but this latest resurgence is more widespread than we had thought initially. Odilio chuckled out of that and muttered under his breath, the might of the Brazilian Navy cannot defeat a few pirates. Unbelievable. Locke gave Odilio a quick but stern glance and did not say anything in response. Arnaldo continued undisturbed by Odilio's comments. Pirates continued to harass the fishermen and attack tourist boats. It only took a few months ago when the wealthy Japanese couple had been taken hostage by pirates out while whale watching. It's only emboldened further pirates to harass their waters. Uh, there are simply too, just too many of them, or just two destroyers to deal with. Meanwhile, subsistence fishermen from West Africa and large commercial fishing f uh, ships from Central Africa continue to illegally enter our waters to take large amounts of fish. The Central African ships mainly for our prized lobsters. As I've stated, the two destroyers are simply not enough. I'm requesting a larger task force to stop this threat once and for all. I well, remain quiet, thinking about all the possible courses of actions and what may have happened during a penguin's choice. After about ten seconds, he spoke. Arnaldo, you will have your task force. More growth, please. Please, more growth. Vacation destinations. It was a hectic night in the vast presidential office, and Yanyo Quadros and his aides were sitting at the table making the final preparations for his visit to the Copra Spirit Sphere. It's going to be the most critical task the eccentric vice president had to face so far, and as a visit to the second biggest economic bloc could bring some much needed investment in the Brazilian economy, perhaps even speeding up the construction of the Trans Amazonian Highway. As others at the table discussed the great opportunities to come, Quadros pondered how he could make this visit a remarkable one. Ah, Mr. Vice President, and aided her and updated his thoughts. We believe we have to devise a plan. A great plan. Once you arrive in Tokyo, we shall... Tokyo? No, no, that will not do, Quadros exclaimed as the room grew quiet. We'll all head certain to the Vice President with puzzled looks on their faces. If we visit Japan first, it will be very and we'll only visit. We should visit Nanjing first. Mr. Vice President, if we visit China first, the Japanese are not going to be happy about it. We might lose our trust, may not get the best, we... Nonsense, Quadros cut him off. I'm sure the Prime Minister would be delighted to know his country is the main course of the visit. As the room now grew louder, with many trying to convince Yanu not to go to China first, Edna Lot sat close by the PSD members, listening closely as the discussion unraveled, trying to hold some back their laughter from Quadros' nonsense. After some time passed, Edna walked to a nearby telephone and called her father. Hello, father. Seems that even without alcohol, Quadros is still a very sober man. It seems like he's convinced that going to China before Japan is a good idea. If his crew isn't able to convince him otherwise, he'll turn to Brazil into a laughingstock all across the sphere. And Enrique Lot slapped his hand on his face and sighed audibly at the other end of the phone. Let's discuss this with him today. I'm too busy to leave it to his delegation. Why would you want to do that? How's development doing? I want to invest more. Hey, not bad. 40% every year, but roughly a little more than 1%. Sweeping the cherry blossoms. After a long and tiring trip, Genio Quadros is in a delegation finally arrived in Japan. Getting off his plane, he immediately felt overwhelmed as he watched a large crowd cheering for him, waving Japanese and Brazilian flags in unison. 
Look at that. Well, uh, Phil, with ecstasy, Quadros way back in the crowd as he stood on the boring bridge. At this very moment, Quadros felt as if he were the president of Brazil. Quadros stepped on the red carpet, waiting for him at the bottom of the stairs, walking as seemingly unintoxicated, with a wide and goopy grin on his face, as the Japanese guards surrounded him, observing him with some confusion. At the end of the carpet, he met with Iroya Ino, with whom he exchanged a bow and took a picture with before walking off. Look at that inflation reduction. Beautiful. <laughs> Shortly after, they were greeted by the NHK news reports, asking questions about his goals and his visit and how they would benefit relations to Brazil. Quadros paused his walls for a second, perhaps in order to ponder his next words. Back at home, Lot was sitting down drinking a small cup of whiskey while watching his partner arrive in Japan without any issues in crisis. Soon, it would be his time to get ready to meet the Americans on the other end. The American ambassador, Lincoln Gordon, nervously watched the vice president arrive in Japan, thinking that this could only spell doom for American interests in Brazil. Quadros knew he had to speak cautiously. Yeah, for if he said something out of place, someone would not be happy. As if on cue, the reporter leaned their max closer to probably quadros to say, they look forward to establishing stronger economic diplomatic ties to the Japanese sphere, look forward to be viewing the beautiful cherry blossoms in the country, and meeting the emperor. I'll go with that one. Hey, deficit's green now. Nice. 10% growth. Not enough. It's not Guangdong, but my god, it's just not enough. Addressing the legislature. Look at this. Oh. Quadros looked on at the audience and all. It was a grand salon filled with who... Uh, he knew were grand politicians, all very well versed and very well judgmental, like me. He judged Edna's work would suffice to give a good, if not a decent speech over the Japanese national legislator. He called forth for the attendees' attention, slightly raising his hand. The Japanese has shown that it's capable of t being taken as an example to follow, an inspiration to all nations of the world and how a country can prosper and develop economically. And f it's fascinating. That's one of my personal inspirations for me in Brazil. He took a pause, tapping his fingers onto the table for him. A conservative moral stature and traditional values of Japanese culture keep a strong and healthy country, alongside its pan Asian brotherhood and regional unity, a model which Latin America would most certainly benefit from. Though short, the speech left no bitter taste in the legislative attendees' mouths. Instead, Quadros found himself receiving a polite applause. Another controversy averted? Yeah, just perhaps. Oh, 3%, huh? That ain't much. Ooh. It's not bad. Election date in October. Oh, we got a long time to go with this. So development-wise, where are we at? Hmm. I'm not sure. Should we focus really on one, or should we focus on several? Lightly developed, partially industrialized. Hmm. Make it even more mechanized? I think that's the one. Let me know what way you do um, this as well. What would you do? Mechanized, sponsor growth, encourage migration. Let's born in Tokyo. Quad just finally achieved it, outsmart outsmarting his aides and confidence. Lot had sent over to keep him in check. It was free now for at least a moment, free to enjoy the charm of Tokyo and its bright color technological golden age, the lights were nearly blinding, not even in Rio. <laughs> Could Quadros find himself in such a luxurious environment? So much so that the entire location was almost alien to him. Little food stands and souvenir shops plagued as far as the eye could see, giving the streets a cozy air of mercantilism and bustling life. For a moment, Quadros nearly forgot there were only a few hours before he had to return to his summary, summary duties. Meetings and interviews and speeches were instead he could be marching down the fine, lighted streets. Well, away from all the politics, he swore to dedicate himself to. He shrugs, ready to lose his last few hours in good faith rather than worry, to which he notices some sake, a beverage, alcoholic, but far more delicious than anything in Brazil, though he must remain sober for the time for the meeting to come, perhaps if only. Well, and drink can do no harm, no? Ah, uh, it's best if you're not. Best if you don't. Best if you don't. An imperial honor. Quadros curtsied over to the welcoming party, arriving only for a few minutes earlier than expected, clad from head to toe in acceptable professional wear. Escorted down a few hallways, turning from the left to right and right to left, losing himself in the labyrinth of the palace, he finally gathered at a large opening behind the one last set of doors. In inadequate awe, Quadros uh, went to, to bow to the presence of the emperor. It was a particular experience, as if the environment irradiated some sort of importance. Little words were factually exchanged between Quadros and the emperor, though it soon became a product of meeting. He said a sigh of relief. He knew things would change now. The Japanese now knew Quadros was a trustable man and a great help for their work in the Brazil and their own personal interests, unlike the PSD. Japan had re has relief of a good backbone in negotiations and mutual respect. A world done success as we go to America next. No, you want yellow. Probably. Nice. Oof. <coughs> I'm not going to lie. I don't think I understand this. But I choose funny color. Freedom to distress. All right, you know why you're all here. Give me some dirt on this crock, Roach. Uh, Carlos uh, Lacerda clapped his hands and wrote a small name at the top of a large blackboard in front of the crowd in the meeting room. Enrique Lot. 
Lacerda had 13 of his best journals on Memphis, getting every deed, backroom deal, and possible scandal. Brazil's current president had been even possibly involved in. Now they were ready to present their findings, or rather their lack of findings. When nobody spoke, Lacerda threw his hands up in the air. What? You've been looking into those probate for months now. Give me something. A nervous looking woman near the back of the room cleared her throat and shakily stood up, all eyes turned on her. Oh, sir, we regret to inform you that we found uh, almost nothing, sir, as far as we can tell. She looked expectantly at her vaguely nodding counterparts. The law is clean. The only concrete accusations are very minor, nothing worthy of you in a tabloid. As far as we can tell, the man is untouchable. She sat back down, the awkward silence resumed. Well, Sarah looked around the room and sighed, Cross, I don't have time for this. I'd have put off a meeting with my poverty council for this, you understand? Rio has the highest rates of unemployment and homelessness in the country, and I should be dealing with it right now instead, or I'm talking to a group of professional simpletons. The young man in the front stood up, his face fixed with an embarrassed indignation. What the heck do you want from us? We just can't make crap pop. Let's to laugh and look back at his chalk. Watch me do so. Lot seen with a woman half his age. Lot, the patriot or CIA spy. Fraud. President steals votes. Lot, bot. On and on, the Senator wrote, covering the board and not catching headlines and random accusations, so every inch was covered by a story. The Senator turned back to the crowd, now staring at him with a mix of disgust, apprehension, and a strange uh, kind of excitement. Get riding out of the city to fix. The Senator forgot to leave the chalk. Who cares if he's with a woman half his age? Who cares? Younger women are better. Don't quote me on that. To those who reject. It's taken a while. Let's finally hear the reason Quadros had set off for Japan in the first place. The deal envisioned by the Kubishek was finally going to become a reality. Brazil would receive a boon to its industrialization, the Japanese would get their agriculture and minor victory over the Americans, while we'll get equipment for uh, egregious or egregiously expensive highway, and get excited. Everyone gets what they want. Oh, uh, boy, did they. Quadros knew that the deal wasn't as fair as everyone thought. There were farmers back in Sao Paulo who were getting the short end of the stick with this deal. Maybe you could do something for them. No, 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 wait. It was too late, wasn't it? He stood by the press, surrounded the table with the papers laid on, and a new idea came to him. We could make a scene and demand concessions. Even if the Japanese refused to listen to him, he could show the boys back home that he popped for them, even when Lot didn't. On the other hand, trying to get more out of a deal already negotiated for better polls back home was somewhat short-sighted. Decisions, decisions. As one of the men offered him a pen, he made his choice. Probably shouldn't push her luck. Forever hold your peace. It had taken a while, but it's finally here. The reason Quadros had sent out for Japan in the first place. The deal envisioned by Kubishak was finally going to become a reality. Uh, did I read this one? Another day, another success. Yeah. I just read that one. That's weird. Okay, whatever. Toscano on the patrol. I'm not Toscano Arnaldo. Arnaldo Toscano. Was sitting in the captain's quarters of uh, the cruiser Almirante de Madares. Awaiting a report on the latest skirmish between the ships and the group of pirates, he waited for the reporters began to stew in frustration. For over a decade, the Germans had continued to humiliate Brazil, constantly crossing over Brazilian waters and fishing. Undermining his country's sovereignty, the Germans had only been getting more and more aggressive with their fishing in the constant bombing campaigns of West Africa, driving more and more men to the piracy to live. Toscano sighed as he thought about this when suddenly the report came in. Through all ships are deployed on schedule, twelve pirate vessels have been destroyed utterly, three have been captured, and seven have fled Brazilian waters, all this with zero casualties. The young comms officer spoke in a grinding monotone, giving a report with a serious expression of grim with grim certainty. Understood that tell the ships to rejoin the task force, Toscano quickly replied, and for the first time that week, Toscano allowed a smile to emerge on, the, on his face. The slot gave an expanded uh, task force, he was able to effectively deal with excursions against both pirates and German fight, fishing vessels. Toscano truly believed that the, finally the lobster war would be put to an end. The Germans would push back one way or another. Stop the companies. While the African fishermen and pirates are a problem, the greater problem still posed by the German Reichs Commissariat and the corporations that run on walk with their, within their lands. Large fishing crawlers from the RK, uh, primarily Siegfried Müller's in South Africa, frequently intrude in Brazilian waters to fish illegally and so what they can get to gluttons and gourmands all across the world. They put these illegal gains to the use of their finance or terrible colonial governments that grind human beings to dust in order to perpetuate the deluded superiority of their imaginary Aryan race. If we have attain final victory in the lobster war, we must pressure either the Reichs Commissariats or the corporations into no longer continuing to violate our territorial integrity. Uh, Nippon, Nihao Gongzu. Gongu. Quadros woke up with a grin and a skip and a step. Yesterday had been almost perfect. The deal was signed, celebrations were worth the tax money, dinner was delicious, Edna was too busy to badger him, and the drinks wouldn't stop, or at least that's how he was pretty sure it went. Uh, around two hours into making Japan's Brazilian embassy, the best place to be east of Rio, someone pulled some special sake and his memory just became a little spotty. Like mine. And it was probably fine worrying about it, it wouldn't change anything, and he had a plane to catch. As the Tokyo skyline disappeared from him, Quadros took a moment to reflect on the good times he and the team had, had uh, before feeling a fresh wave of excitement over the destination head. Oh, John, he could see it now. The rest of countryside, the developing cities, the ancient sites, and just thinking of all the pandas. It's yeah, so a shame, it'll be a wonderful vacation of a diplomatic trip now, if we could just get the Japanese to relax a little. Maybe the Chinese would be less strict? Yeah, maybe. As we do have a cup of tea here. Should have chose coffee, but I don't want to drink coffee at 9.30 o'clock at night when I'm recording this.
Hmm. Five percent. I want to go where we can probably do okay. Ooh, that's close. Ooh, that's close-ish. Oh, some places we're leading very, by quite a bit. Not there. Not really there. Definitely not here. Um, we're doing well there. Well, we'll go there. We're not quite there yet, but we're getting close. Quite close, I'd say. Hey, but happy uh, April, everybody. Happy April. We have so many days until the election. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Dinner and offer. China was a beautiful country, even if you had to ignore the fascists and the uh, jackboots to uh, appreciate it. Uh, Quad just took a few opportunities he had to enjoy the size and culture of the subjugated nation. Uh, not an easy task when he's being hounded by both the Chinese and Japanese negotiators and lots of lackeys who insisted on watching his every move, of course. 10% <laughs> growth, my bad. So, the ex army boy didn't think he could handle this well, shows what he knows the negotiations went swimmingly all in no time. He had representatives of the two spheres' most essential nations eating out of his hands. All that was left for the day was a chat with the diplomatic or diplomats on the non important issues and enjoy an ex excellent Peking duck. With a generous sip of wine, he smiled and laughed along with his dinner mates until he noticed one Chinese official trying to get his attention, of course. <laughs> Mr. Boss President, one of the men began to translate the man to form to celebrate. To celebrate the new friendship between the two republics, we wish to offer a little gift. A panda bear from one of our illustrious zoos. The official gave a small smile as Qu Quadros picked up, picked up the offer. We can prepare for safe travel as soon as you wish. Quadros had already decided he was bringing the majestic creature back to Brazil one way or another. The question was whether to accept it now and let everyone know about it or just put it off for a bit so the Japanese could get a heads up. He was sure they wouldn't mind too much, but they seemed to really hate surprises again. But asked for forgiveness and that permission. Ah, we'll do that one. Carrier organization? We don't have any carriers. Uh, what this one? Blue water. We want to, we're bold and adventurous here in Brazil. <coughs> I want more political power, though, so we can at least increase growth one more time. But maybe that's just me. Maybe that's just me, god dang it. As we're trying to train some soldiers. We have a lot of different units here, but a surprise announcement and an embarrassment. Uh oh. And to find ourselves with an easy smile, she discussed business with Japanese diplomats. For once, Quatch has followed the plan set for himself without a hitch, and all their hard work was bearing fruit. She's still going to keep an eye on him, anyways, though. She and her counterparts stood off to the sidelines as the vice president and other diplomats spoke with the press about the trade deals. So far, things were looking good. And one last thing I wish to announce Quadros had the kind of excited look on his face that Edna had to come to associate with imminent disaster. With permission from the Republic of China's government, the people of Brazil will have the pleasure of a new panda bear for our nation's most illustrious zoo in Rio de Janeiro. Wait, what? When the heck did they agree to this? The Japanese looked as surprised as she was and more displeased. When one of the diplomats was asked by how the now very excited press about this agreement, he said the deal was still in the drafts. On the other hand, the Chinese looked very pleased with themselves, no doubt because they managed to pull a fast one on their overlords in public. Wiping the surprise off her face, Edna turned back to the now irritated Japanese officials with her utmost diplomatic smile. Well, gentlemen, I think we have much to discuss. Would you like to talk over some tea? Let's get ridiculous, man. And that's okay with me. Well, I come yellow. Um, how are we doing here? Well, we're doing okay. It doesn't really need to do much. Relationship satisfactory. It's only 1962. And it's only April. So, lobster war. Farewell to those China Knights. The journey through China was an experience that neither Jean Neo Quadros nor Edna Law would ever forget. From the sight of the summer palace and the forbidden city to the sounds of everyday life and festivities and fine dining marked the trip's high points. It wasn't without its hiccups, the impulsive and odd behaviors of Brazil's vice president and the inflexibility of the Japanese diplomats made for some uncomfortable situations. Even so, the journey proved very fruitful. Chinese rice for Brazilian oranges, steel for products, and the promises made before Quadros' detour was finally being made a reality, as Quadros and his entourage thanked for the host for their generosity and help, the vice president felt a sense of great pride in the accomplishment. Rising aboard his aircraft, the man brims with anticipation as they finally make for the land of the rising sun. Again? Far away within his presidential palace, Henrique Lock can only hope that their second trip goes more smoothly than the last. Well, they can behave himself in front of the Emperor. But we already there, though. Fish in a barrel, but crap, 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 pull up the pods! Kwame heard the frenzy shouts of his first mate above the decks and scrambled up to join him. He understood his panic immediately. A Brazilian pirate was strafing one of their sister ships and even smelled dingy, dingy, a ways off the port side. Even a boat like that paid for itself a hundred times out over there, raking in thousands of Reich's marks per week in precious and ungutter lobster. Well, practically unguarded, as he watched a vessel get riddled with bullets, Kwame realized that the rumors of Brazil taking action were as unfounded as he thought. Just cut him. We don't have time. Get the engine running. We need to go now. Kwame hurried up to the helm and turned a complete 180 away from the fighter, hoping against hope that it was too distracted with the other ships in his little flotilla to chase him after him in particular. He might need to get a new profession after this. Well, assuming he survived, as they sped off. The fighter finally sank the remains of the first target. The pilot checked around for new targets as every ship in the flock he ambushed began to scatter like frightened pigeons. 
As I passed over the small dinghies, a few decently sized trawlers, sack there was even a freighter or two. One of the freighters in particular caught his eye, a big dude that had been broken off from the pirate fleet before any of the others. But as he prepared us in calmly as a crew beneath the seas, along with their illegal cargo, he knew something else, a small vessel in amongst the swarms, but more significantly, more modern than any of the other vessels. He he focused in, he saw why, ha, he had a great new target. Their Nazi ringleader was painted a bright red swastika on his desk. Death, search and destroy. Maybe a weekly stability that we get to do. Uh, Passed by the Germans, well. Search and destroy. Our, our mod, uh, Admiral Arnaldo's plan is to put our own local task force to use to suppress the illegal fishermen and pirates ourselves. He advises us uh, to move at once to search and destroy the illegal craft until they're no longer a threat rather than waste precious time and effort negotiating with Bonga villagers, camel ridden tribesmen, and crazy resistance fighters who cannot admit defeat. Lord has decided on the advice of the Minister of War to take up the Admiral's plan and ignore the offer by Vice President Quadros. We shall defeat the pirates as we have been doing already with fire and steel. By the legit balance effect, god dang it. The diplomatic tug of war. It wasn't often that Quadros found himself at losses where to go next, but the two envelopes in his hand gave him pause. The trip wasn't supposed to be over. The visits were made, the deals were signed, but the only th thing left was to go home. It's probably what Lot wanted, but on the other hand, it wasn't every day that you got informal invitations from two of Asia's senators of industry. Guangdong and Manchuria, the sphere's rising star and the oldest workhorses. One was the bustling tech of industry and of a country, a place for innovation with an eye for the future. The other was once upon a time golden goose of the Japanese empire, where resources were tirelessly extracted to fuel superpower, and the competition for foreign investments was famous even in Brazil. Quadros could, pre could present with pride that the two countries were vying for his attention. It was a shame that he was too confident that he couldn't get away with visiting both. Lao well, put his foot down at that, but he would listen to the idea of a new trade deal with either of them. At first glance, Manchuria was the obvious choice. This visit had been about industrialization in the first place, and the Manchu had proven their worth on that front. On the other hand, though, Guangdong's developments were auspicious, and a visit that could get Brazil on the ground floor for something world changing, of course. Both carry the stigma of exploitation and the misery for the native peoples. Maybe the moral choice to ignore both is more important than anything else economic. To Guangdong! The palace at Don's Edge. Julius Gold Kubishek had not shown much interest in entering the Alvorada Palace, but it's its presidential residence since ending his mandate. The modernist building, the Pearl of Kubishek's new, industrial, new national capital, had not seen the man behind its creation in a few years now. President Lutz certainly wondered how long the situation would last. President and former president walked in front of the house in the wee hours of the morning. Both men were early risers, as such law was never to surprise the maternal visit from his ally. Even that morning's conversation turned acrimonious. The originator of the nation's new capital, Julius Lino, Kubishek had an architect's eye, and in an ideal world, the former president would leave very little of the political arena to chance. You can't simply brush out those industrialists, especially not when the PSD needs their support to maintain the electoral lead. What I do to irritate them, JK, to tell them they should lower their prices? That average biz Brazilian cannot afford a car? They know that already. You, Kubishek, finally went quiet to the Lutz's delight. All the best to enjoy an early morning walk. Both men paced around the courtyard, bodyguards trailing them beyond the courtyard, the new capital started to drift awake, ending another night of the soon forgotten dreams. Finally, Lot was the first to break the silence. Things are all well, JK. Things will remain well. The PSD is in a good place. You ensure it is. Don't worry too much. You worry too much. As long as you put in the work, the people will reward us. Kubitsch, uh, not a grimly. He shook it lots hand and began to head away. The rising sun cast long shadows on the departing figure. A alvorada de um novo dia. Yes, exactly. How about over here? 24%. Yeah, 24% is a little far away. That's 9% uh, away. 12% away. Way too far away. Not far away. The future's here. Quas was not quite sure what to make up. Uh, uh, one expected me to set and entertain the Guangdong businessman's request to give a speech for them, but what did see was nothing short of incredible. Cities of neon, various titans of technology, and innovation whose factories churned out everything from home appliances to the latest in musical weaponry. Guangdong truly felt like something from the future, speaking before an audience of the country, colonies, wide variety of Japanese technocrats, Chinese workers, and everything in between. He stood on a speech about the, the awe of the works inspired, as well as having a side focus on cooperation between the countries as rising economic powers. Worked like a charm, of course. As soon as the speech was over, a group of businessmen invited over, him over to the office's back room to discuss a trade deal. It proved to be a streamlined process. It seemed they have been preparing for this occasion as well in advance and boiled down to two options. The first centered around Lot's Amazonian highway to excessive debt. Specifically, it was about tools and machinery that could quicken the process. The second was based around giving Brazil a foot in the door of the country's technolo technology trade. It was giving Brazil a boost over its regional contemporaries. The sooner the highway is finished, the better. Oh, tell me about those new products. Uh, I want this one, but eventually the thing is going to be done. Give us that growth, god dang it. Uh. But happy May. 45 minutes in, basically, and we're only in May. Oh, boy. There's a lot of reading in Brazil.
Oh my god, yes. Yeah, still going back up a little more too, which sucks. Oh, hello. Oh well. The future is flawed. Oh no. That's not good. <coughs> hey, it's almost quarter done complete. With their negotiations finished, Quadras and Comedy could look at the port of the night on the town across Guangdong province. It was an experience none of them would ever forget. While Brazil had big cities, none of them were like Guangzhou, Kongshu, or Hong Kong. Although it took some effort, they restrained themselves from turning the trip into a shopping spree. Instead, they took numerous notes on various developments for things to keep an eye on. He, in particular, was interested in the state's weapons developments for Brazil and portable music players and stereos for himself. It wasn't all perfect, however. Guangdong radiated an atmosphere of inequality. The impoverished and downtrodden were familiar sights. Smog was lying everywhere, and if you squinted through it, you could see gangs lining up in the back alleys or street corners in search of easy marks. Most disturbingly were the nets he kept seeing set up around the sea, which he had learned after much probing were for suicides of all things. So Quad was bored as crowds in high spirits. So long as Guangdong addresses issues of poverty, crime, pollution, and unhappy office life in a reasonable fashion while maintaining a strong economy, you sure the country would be a wild success. Now if one can get some of those advertising jingles out of my head. Absolutely. Nice. Getting closer down here. The prodigal VP returns. When the Enrique allowed to decide to send Quadros out of the sphere to sign Brazil's treaty with Japan, he said with great reluctance. There were days when he remained awake at night, worried that the vice president's oddities would end the visit earlier and make the deal fall through. Fortunately, the broom man had proven him wrong, and when Quadros uh, to his office with a swagger in his staff and a conqueror's grin, he received him warmly. Welcome, Mama. Her things went well. Lost Buck with a tame smile, all the while keeping his ill memories of Quadros' his past followings under the rug for the moment of rare success. Well, how? They just went about perfect, the man beamed with pride. How are things over here? The deal's been present and should be passed rather smoothly. Lot shrugged his sh shoulders. The only way that truly poses it is the UDM. Oh, well, just when I thought no one had a bigger stick up their butts than the Japanese. They should have laughed before Quadros let a yawn. I suppose that's my cue to head home. Farewell and good night. The two shook hands before parting ways. Enjoy your rest. You've earned it. Nice. The relationship improves. Satisfactory. Growth increases. Oh, yearly trans Amazonian highway construction increases. Yeah, we're cooperative for now. But look at that growth. Nearly 13%, my friends. Of course, never enough growth, but whatever. Stop the companies. Bada. Now we're going to destroy the relationship with Amelia. It's cool for Annie. Or Anne. And it's with the deepest honor and gratitude to the people of Rio and the Jewish community that inaugurate Anne Frank's secondary school. The Sarah to cut the ribbon, then turned to point out a smartest grin as he faced the cameras and an applause game, even though it bow for the press's sake. He continued on to his speech, staring hard at the neighboring building, the German consulate, just opted him for the new school. The Nazi dudes had angrily shut their curtains. Good, he'd make sure they got front row seats to the Jew see Jewish children alive and well, attending school and living normal lives. I stayed up until 5 a.m. reading Anne Frank's diary, mere months after it had been first smuggled out of Germany and published around the free world at an indictment of German atrocities. It is truly a moving document. The poor girl died alone and betrayed, starving and sick, robbed of any dignity she had left. He would have said hi, and instead of uh, the disgusting Nazi flag flying outside his concept, they did the gall to taint Brazil with his hateful presence. The least I can do as a venture was give uh, her people some of that dignity back, and God willing, I will make sure Brazil protects you or die in an attempt. The loading applause could deafen into our stadium, and Frank smiles in the afterlife. Ripe harvest. I like him ripe. Edge Bebel. Edge Bebel considers himself to be very lucky to have found employment away from the brutal diamond mines of Central Africa. The captain, one of the many Belgians inhabiting Leopoldville, decided to overlook his background because of a serious shortage in personnel and he showed up. Uh, and it showed. The people that made up the ship's crew were incredibly diverse. Germans, Belgians, English, and despite being the only dark-skinned member of the crew, he wasn't really put through any kind of different treatment from his peers, something which made Edge Bebel grow to deeply appreciate life at sea when compared to his time ashore. He wasn't dumb. As soon as he learned the job offer, he already had a vague idea of the motives behind the lack of personnel and the informality of it all, and it quickly became clearer when they first spotted a Brazilian patrol boat in the distance. They were always fast and paid, and job paid more than a single trip than what his family had probably seen in a lifetime, so he wasn't complaining but despite the anxiety slowly building up in him. He told himself that it would be one more trip and he quit, but greed would always get the best of him. This past month had been particularly tense. Patrol boats had gone closer than ever, close enough to attempt to ram, and they had also been hearing them mentioned over the radio, how Brazilians were wrapping up their efforts. Well, the captain was worried and almost called the trip half off halfway through. The crew, along with the edge bubble, managed to convince him otherwise. After all, the harvest had been particularly great, and they make a fortune to continue. He was in the kitchen when it happened. A loud thump rocked the ship in all directions, and he barely managed to stay on his feet. Edge bubble heard the engines of the ship suddenly ground to halt and couldn't get half away. Towards the door before three men came rushing in and pointed the carbines at him. Realizing what had happened, Edge Bebel surrendered and was quickly brought about handcuffed and lined up uh, along with the rest of the crew. As people shouted words in Portuguese he couldn't understand, the captain were escorted among, uh, towards another ship. 
The sights of the swastika being lowered to the replaced by the flag of Brazil briefly caught the interest of all those present. Earth provides enough to satisfy every man's needs, but not every man's greed. Send them back. The next part of the plan is simple. Send the pirates back to West Africa. Once they're back in their homelands, there'll be no problem. Furthermore, we can save ourselves from having to spend any more of those nuisances than the valuable plane ticket. It'll be an easy and efficient pro process. If these people have brains, they'll know better than coming back into and getting their blown out of our waters a second time. <laughs> and if they don't learn that first time, well, beatings and gunfire necessary will be more than sufficient to cure such disorders. Yes. Quadros visits China. China. Uh, extra, extra, is rather newsboy in Brazil city corners that day. Vice President Quadros visits China. Brazilian Japanese relations on the upswing. Quadros had arranged for a visit to the east for the stated purpose of the bettering of relations with the co prosperity sphere. Now, the visit began more of a tourist visit than a diplomatic mission, taking side of the Forbidden City, where he visited the museum and witnessed a great many cultural artifacts of China's imperial period. There was a fine dinner in the Brazilian embassy with the president of China, Gao Zongwu, the Brazilian ambassador, Sergio de Quezo Duarte, and the sphere representative in China, Takeo Miki. The dinner was filled with much amicable discussion among all these involved, and the Brazil's intentions of a deeper relationship with the sphere being made openly and explicitly. We're shared in an anti-imperialist struggle, the ambassador said, and we look to deepen our relations with the like-minded nations and those who have shared struggles against colonialism. May we send his brothers. The comments made the intentions clear, too clear, as this was contrary to the interests of the United States and contrary to the opinions that many domestic citizens, many groups, especially pro-open, pro-open, left-wing organizations, slung around accusations towards quadros such as Nazi or Japanese bootlicker, along with other words the newspapers were not allowed to publish. Following the dinner and unpublished event, Quadros, Gao, and Miki met in a private office to discuss trade specifically. Upon his return, Quadros regarded his trip, talks included, as a great success. Who but Quadros could do that? Who knows? Ah, yellow. I'm kind of waiting, hoping it's just October already, because this is it's a lot. But happy June! Hope it'll get above 11 or 12%, maybe to 13%. Uh, GDP growth. Effectively, we already are at 13% growth, but whatever. Ah, it went lower, lower. We're reducing it by how much? By 3%. Oh, it's not going to get any better. Dang it. That sucks. Um, I'm not sure which one we want. I don't trust our guys too much. I mean, our military is okay. Five militia, which sucks. We do have a helicopter division, but it's only 10 combos, which kind of. Is, eh. We have horse divisions too, huh? We could get rid of them. Are we making any helicopters in general? What are we even making? I don't even know what we're making. Basic jet fire CVs, transport helis, um, experimental helicopters, scouts. Well, we don't really don't need that one. Greyhounds. Honestly, because we we just focus on helicopters, that'd be kind of nice. Air assaults companies. We have medevacs, and we do have air assault companies. How are these guys ten combo with? I don't understand. Mobile. I don't understand how these guys are tank combo with. Because there's only four there. There's four here. Is that slightly bugged? It would cost a crap ton of political power to do so. Industry, maneuver warfare, uh, tanks. This is really heavy on tanks. We don't have that many tanks. A decent amount, but. Uh, air assault. I think I might just go down this way just because we can. Yeah, I'll go this way. Why not? Ground support. Oh, that one. Combined operations. Hey, there goes those guys. Uh, red. Red. Better dead than red. Uh, blue? I'm going to start doing the blue one, I guess. Up there. Development? Partially, lightly, undeveloped. Nice. Lots of industrial stuff is getting done. It was very good. As we're trying to build just roads. Ah, there we go. Last one. Ah, not quite 13%, darn it. But we're working on it. Search and destroy and send them back. Hey, we won the World Cup! Yay! Congratulations to the champions. We get no political power from that, darn it. Oh, never mind, we got stability. 
And they, so ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to announce that the Brazils won the World Cup. The small crowd surrounding the radio burst into cheers. Um, a swing mirrored millions of, over, of times over as nearly every Brazilian turned into the end of the world's biggest announcement. Biggest tournament. Oh. Many women are bracing nation over, celebrating a hard-fought victory in the defense of Brazil's football supremacy. Bars were covered with revelers. Fireworks went off, and hundreds of thousands of corks were popped. Nine months after the fact, hospitals and wind would mark a minor baby boom. Hmm. Rumors had abounded <clears throat> that before the event, the Brazilian team was off their game, untrained and overconfident in their victory in 1958. The myth was disproved the moment Brazil took the field, sweeping the Chileans with an indisputable 3-1 victory. Brazilians had once again secured the position as the best athletes in the world, and in the moment of victory, all the nation's strife seemed to disappear. Highway worker. Every crew packed around their own singular radio and rejoiced. Navy ships echoed with cheer, but businessmen threw extravagant parties. Even the men in Brazil's highest offices allowed themselves a day to celebrate. More than a few gunshots went off, and barely any of the, survived. the fireworks were legally owned. In those hours of victory, Brazil was united, if only for a while. In that moment, Brazil celebrated as one. I expect a visitor. Oh, that's good. Uh, before we read that one. There you go. Calm afternoons did not come often to the presidential office. Uh, President Enrique Texera Lott was at work on a few present files, hoping to cash in on the uninterrupted, uh, interrupted work time to generate a free evening. Lott knocking on the door, no such luck. Yes, Vice President, Lott asked without looking up. Enrique, your order to the Navy it can be still be commanded, countermanded. I've been looking over for a few emissaries from the African sides, and I think we can go for talks and cooperation on the issue, in particular the envoys from No. Quadros's torrent of words was for once completely dried up. The president looked at him, shook his head. There will be no countermandating Janio for my decision to smash the pirates is final. The president allowed knew his reputation, that he never changed his mind once it was set. It appeared that his vice president blessedly would listen to reason for once and not waste another word on the topic. Quadros' bottom lip moved uselessly, stuck as it was mid-word. Then the vice president closed his mouth and stood there uselessly, waiting, uh, wasting lots of precious free time. If free time needed to actively run the country instead of proposing here hair brained Lusotropical schemes, will that be all, Genio? Yes, Enrique, it was lost turn to be taken aback. The Vice President's fist shook impotently. The depth of Quadros' dismay and anger was apparent. The Vice President was a passionate man, yet even it was rare for him to betray so brazenly his anger at a political rival. Lot did not find it in himself to feel bad about sticking to his plan. It took until a few minutes after the last of Quadros' steps echoed away for a lost piece of mind to return. He'll get over this. Calming down the car, men down. When Giusino Kubishak arrived at the meeting of the PSD donors in the automobile manufacturing industry. They sort of car magnets and the meeting were full in full cry. Telling us to lower prices, how bloody ridiculous can he get? It, uh, has his officer's hat grown into his head and replaced his brain? Doesn't he know how important our profits are, darn it? We elected him and this is how he repays us? Gentlemen, oh, Kubishak went to the front of the room and raised his hands for calm. The complaining executives calmed down as he glared at a few of them. Gentlemen, gentlemen, I must ask you to think through the situation. The president may have uttered a foolhardy remark, but you speak as if his word is law and goes to question. You speak as if myself or Senor Nevis has no power to make him reconsider things. Kubishak smirked internally. He did not need to know that Lot had in fact gone out and refused to reconsider things, and even if he does go through with it, let us be realistic, gentlemen. Lot and the PSE remain the best choice you have. If you go to Lacerda, what will that crow do? He'll cut your subsidies in the name of freeing the market and letting a bunch of foreign imports that'll crowd you out. At this, the corporate leaders started murmuring, Kubishek. Or, why do you call him Kubishek? Kubitschek. Because that's his name. Continues, and if that fails, maybe you'd like to try Senor Pasos, who will probably make your all start goose stepping and building a Volkswagen? I press my friend Senor Salgado, who will have you screaming Anue uh, at the top of your lungs and make you produce characters that even Pedro Alvarez Cabral would find outdated at this point. The manufacturers were shouting in outrage. Kubitschek uh, raised his hand again and made his final point. You see that being told to reduce your prices is the least of the evils you can deal with in this country. As the men nodded, Kubitschek smirked, you might not have to deal with it for much longer, especially if you stay the course and vote me in the next election. The manufacturers rose in loud applause. The pirates scattered. Although we scattered them. <coughs> No matter what course of action we've taken, no, whether we fought the well placed words, with well placed words, or good strong steel, we, we have succeeded in our task. The pirates were mostly defeated and scattered, instances of illegal fishing, though still significant, have begun to decrease. Most important of all, our fishermen continue to work, or return to work, with the danger of their livelihoods significantly reduced. Our task force will, of course, patrol the areas for the next few months, but the job will be far easier from here on in. As for us, having caught or killed the smaller members of the food chain, it is now time for us to deal with the bigger predators. Nice. And only 12 and a half, that's not bad, but still. Election is kind of critical. Oh, hello. Now it's a terror plot. Oh, good God. What are you doing over here? I thought you turned yellow. A development edict. Hey, recorder done. Nice. These inflation's going down, it's good. 
Oh, I need 10. Oh, god dang it. <sighs> well, that's why we gotta get more political power. God dang it. Two brothers in law walk into a bar. As Gular walked into the governor's office of Rio de Grande do Sul, he heard the song Ma Marcha Solana Brasileira being played on a gramophone as he entered. Brother, you are only two minutes late to new record for a timelessness. Brazil, of course, brother in law said he was sitting at, uh, behind the desk of the office. But as Gular entered, his as entered, he stood up and rapidly approached Goulart and gave him a hug. It's good to see you all as well, Brizola. How's the state? Goulart gulped. Or replied, the hug lasting for a few moments before Brizola broke the hug. Hey, Adriana, get us some coffee. You know the way we like it, Brizola said. To a secretary united and went to the Brizola. And went to do as Brizola wanted before he could turn to Goulart again. Well, the union is calling me a communist traitor and trying to move me, so nothing's changed. How's Maria? Brizola guides Goulart to a comfortable chair, which Goulart sat upon. Maria, she's doing so well. Helping to look after the children while I'm away. While Goulart talked, the secretary returned with coffee for the two men before leaving. Brazola began to speak. Well, that's good. Tell Maria I sent her my regards. And once, of course, discuss the Senate election. I'm helping direct, direct lead the campaign here, and I'm running in Guan, Guanabara, but we must both know that's a long shot, indeed. We need to for campaigning in Santa Catarina and Parana. If you can provide this, Goulart asked. Brazola stayed quiet for a few moments before considering what Goulart just asked. He was more, likely, more than likely to do his own Senate race, but the party came first. Of course, you can rely on me. Modern Canton. Oh, oh, sub stuff. We do have a few subs. Uh, carrier organization, sword efficiency. We only have one. Uh, screen defense. Battleship. Ooh, battleship, capital ship attack. What's in the Navy? We have five heavy cruisers and, and that one. Five heavy cruisers. Cruiser organization plus 10. Do we get a cruiser organization over here? Plus five. Splitters. I declare this meeting adjourned. Uh, Zhao Amazona slammed his gavel again and again, just really trying to stop the riot brewing at the Brazilian Communist Party's latest emergency meeting. He commanded a significant sect of the party and would be able to de facto his leader, if not for the sectarian dude <coughs> currently standing atop <coughs> uh, the bar's central table. Luis Carlos Prestes, a native, naive splitter that had for a long time commanded a sect opposed to Amazonas and its coalition of realists within the party. Tension had simmered in the party for a long time, but yesterday's incident had escalated the situation. But the effing gavel down, Zhao, you gosh darn tyrant. This isn't over until your goon is punished for his murder. The process wasn't right in the face, out of breath, but so absolutely determined. Abazonas moved to sl slamming the gavel on the wall and waited for his men to settle down. The party was seconds from an outright brawl between the two factions. They had only taken seconds to bring everyone back together. This would take tact. Shut your mouth, Process. Your mad dog attacked Miguel. There was self-defense, and that's the end of it. The room turned quite immediately, as if everyone of uh, Process's men grouped up around their leader, as though acting on a well-rehearsed script. Prestes cleared his throat, and Amazonas saw tears in his eyes. We knew this day was coming, Yao. What the heck happened to you? Every day you get more violent, more authoritarian. What happened to our plans now that all you talk about is your bloody Algerian revolution? This is the last straw. When would you have had one of your goons kill me of self-defense? This part is no longer about the communist Brazil we're trying to build. It's about you. And with that, the Prestes' men filed out of the door. The remaining members stood confused, deprived of both the fight and half the party's strength. Amazonas collapsed against the back wall and held his head in his hands. How could he do the revolution if his own party is splitting around him? The gal was a pile of splinters. Hey, look at that. It's yellow now, too. And we can afford this. Um, honestly, let's do it. Undeveloped. Beautiful, my friends. Beautiful. Daily increase by 0.31. Not bad. Daily increase of 0.52. Very good, as we're still training our navy. Air strength, 0.11. It's, well, it's something. But we got to read about Toscano's fishing, finishing touches. Not fishing touches, but finishing touches. Hello, this is Almirante Barrasco to the coast. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Almirante Barrasco. Uh, Admiral Toscano would like to contact President Lott on the next course of action. Can we get a line through? Yes, we'll get you a line to the President right now. There was some static in the clicking as the radio line was connected. To Lott, yes, I was told Admiral Toscano wanted to speak to me. Yes, sir, he's right here. There was some muffled shuffling coming from the ship line. Admiral Toscano came on the line and began to speak to Lott. Uh, President Lott, we've come to the main area where the pirates have been operating. Uh, me and some fellow tacticians have drawn up some plans, and I'd like to go over some of them with you before we take a course of action. Well, what plans do you propose, Admiral? The first one is a complete non-stop search for the pirates. No breaks whatsoever. The men won't like it, but several officers have recommended it. The pirates are a small group and will need to cover a lot of ground if we want to catch them. The second plan is involve the Air Force. We're bringing in some aircraft carriers and search planes to spot them from air and bring in the Navy. What's we'll to make the whole operation more disorganized it means an effective search while sparing the men from work working long hours. The third plan is the most simple one. Just go do a regular search with the regular hours. Continue to sweep as normally we would. Nothing too crazy or stressful, but it'd probably be the least effective of the op options. What is your orders to proceed, sir? A lot grimmest. They would have to move quickly if they wanted to stop these raids of fishermen. Or raids on fishermen. But they don't want to make a bug operation. Think it over one last time he gave his orders. Proceed as normal. We need to move quickly. Do the first plan. As we seize our ships. 
Following the advice given by our army and navy, we will seize the ships that are in our waters, let us send out ships and planes to locate the boats, find the bigger ones, and seize the smaller ones. These rabid corporations will see reason if we attack the only thing that matters to them, the bottom line of their profits. The more boats they lose, the more unprofitable it becomes, and the less they will fish in our waters, but we're going to end the episode all right there, my friends. Hey, roughly 14% growth. If you enjoyed the video, though, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow as we'll continue to fight inflation, and, uh, well, try to see what else we can do with Brazil. Thanks for watching. Have a great Brazilian, 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 Brazilian rest of your day.